All right, so let's see if I can get up here. One thing I'll talk about here in a little bit. It's not what it was. There he is. Um, is I'll be recording every session. So hopefully we're supposed to be in Econ 221. Uh, I'm Professor Lannis. Uh it's a little bit of weird of a time slot for Monday Wednesdays at four to five fifteen. Uh, by the end of the semester, I feel like it's gonna be dark out by the time I get out of here. Uh I've taught here for seven years, and this will be my sixth year, I think. I'm trying to remember. I had a semester or two off of 221, but I pretty much teach it almost every semester. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I like to think I have all the, the kind of wrinkles ironed out here. Um, we'll kind of just go over the syllabus a little bit today. Uh, because we only meet Monday, Wednesday, I'll probably dive a little bit into material. If you want to call it that, it'll be more so like introducing the ideas that we'll be talking about throughout the semester. We won't go too far into detail into anything today. Um, but just give us an idea about what we're going to talk about. So make sure and see if this is going to work for me. Probably not. All right. Tell me how my day's been going. So a couple of things that we're going to need for this class. Um, we do have a book. Um, Yavia and Kelly. Uh, it is, I think I left it off of the slide here, but it is the fourth edition. So that's the newest edition of the book. Um, I really won't be using the book. Uh, and I'm only going to be using it is the online homework platform, as well as it comes with some additional tools that might help you throughout the semester. So you will need an access code to this book. Um, so you can access those online homeworks, those connect homeworks. Um, but other than that, if you don't really need a physical copy, if you really want one, I believe when you purchase the access code, you can also choose the option of purchasing ebook as well. I'm being honest, I would just buy the access code. And if you really want a physical copy of the book, go out and find an older edition, like on Chegg or something, you can probably get it for like $15 if you look at the paperback version. But even that, you don't need the you know physical copy of the book. So we'll be using that. Uh, we'll also be using kind of um, skeleton versions of the lecture. So I'll post those every Sunday night. I get a little bit too much fun one weekend, maybe Monday morning, um, but they'll definitely be here before we start class on Mondays. Uh, it'll basically be the week of lectures. Um, so what we'll cover Wednesday, sorry, Monday and Wednesday's um, class. I'm leaving out a couple things from it. But I'll show you in class just so that everything's not on canvas. You have a little bit more of an incentive to show up to class and kind of fill those in. Also, the things I leave out are usually things that I think are important. So like you've got the skeleton version even pulled up on your computer. As I'm going through the class, if you see something on there that's not on those skeleton version, it's probably a good thing to jot down or a good thing to know. Now, at the end of the week, I'll post the complete version of the slides so you can always go back and look and see what those things were. Um, but it's just a way for me to also kind of uh, overemphasize some things that I think might be important. I also have a YouTube playlist. I won't use this as much as I have the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to act like COVID's not a thing, um, but you know, I obviously it still is. So it might cause somebody to be in and out of class. And so I started today's class. I just hit record on Zoom. I'll hit end record when we're done. It is by no means a perfect substitute for class. All you're getting is the audio from me and me going through the slides. And obviously I move around, I face this way, it doesn't catch my audio as well. So it's by no means a perfect substitute. I'm not gonna make as much of an effort to like make sure um, that I'm staying kind of seated there. I'm not gonna be using the dot cam very often. I'll be using the board a lot. So it's another incentive to show up to class. Anything I do up here, probably a good thing to take notes on, right? Um, but I will post those recorded versions that are at least you can kind of go back and, well, I know that he mentioned something in that class. I can go back to the video and kind of, you know, you know, recheck whatever that was, or, or at least see that example in the slides kind of work through one more time. So that's the link to YouTube uh, playlist. Easier way to get to is probably just going to YouTube, search Professor Lannis on the first one that comes up. I see a couple of familiar faces. You, I think I had in 201, this similar sort of thing. We'll have a playlist. It'll be Econ 221, Fall 2022. Right, you're my only, uh, sorry, I have an honor section as well, but you're my only other kind of non honor section. So you should be the only regular Econ 221 playlist that's up there. And that's where I'll put all the videos that I'm recording. I'll also put up some additional things along the way. So practice exams, um, once we get closer to the exam dates, I'll put up 
videos of me working through the practice exams. So you'll kind of be able to go and, and you know, if you get stuck on one, see me actually like work through it. Uh, I'll post some additional videos um, that I'll call pre-class videos, which I'll discuss a little bit here, just a minute, I'll kind of use those along with eye clickers and some online quizzes. But those I essentially will announce, like let's say today, at the end of class, I would say I'm gonna post a pre-class video that I expect you watch before we meet on Wednesday. And the incentive to watch that will then be that either eye clicker questions or online quiz questions will be tied to whatever that video was. Now they won't be difficult, and I'll discuss a little more about the eye clicker and the online quizzes here in a second. Um, but more so questions of like, well, what topic did that pre-class video cover? And all those pre-class videos are meant to do is kind of prime your brain. I don't expect you to have a mastering of whatever I'm covering in them, but more so just sit down, take your minutes, watch it, and you'll have a little bit more of an idea of the terminology I'm going to use for the upcoming class and the topics that we're going to cover. And I think it just kind of helps the class a little bit smoother and gives us a little bit more time to maybe work through some problems in class together. Um, so I'll also post those that YouTube playlist. But like I said, I'll announce in class and I'll also post something on Canvas uh, when I when I post those. Okay. Questions at this point? Yeah. So is the eye clicker mandatory? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second, but we will be using iClickers in class. You can get the physical version, which used ones are pretty cheap, mm -hmm. um, or you can get the app on your phone. If I think about myself, I mean, if money's no object, I'm probably more likely to treat my iClicker than I am my phone when I leave the house. So, so you know, I think the oh, app... With this old iClicker account? You can use the old ones. You can use iClicker too, as long as it has a code on the back. And that's actually, by the end of class, I'll kind of give you a checklist again. But one of the things that I want you to do by the end of this week, um, I will start using them or expect you to have either the physical version or the app on next Monday's class. But I want you to get on and get your eye clickers registered. All right. So there's a little link on the left hand side. Let's see here. Of Canvas, eye clicker registration. So get on by the end of this week. Make sure you've registered the eye clicker. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. I still record your responses. It's just they won't show up on Canvas until you get it registered. And so it creates a bit of a headache for me, and you can't see kind of your, your updated scores on Canvas. But try to get that done by the end of the week. So that's the first thing. Uh, what else was I saying here? Oh, um, I wanted to mention one more thing about these YouTube. Uh, so me recording this, it's not as useful for when I'm going through things on the board or talking about introducing topics. Um, but we'll do, be doing a lot of Excel in this class. And when I am working on Excel, I'm gonna be in front of here so the audio is clear and it'll also record what I'm doing on my screen. So we'll always have Excel examples before I assign an Excel homework. So those recordings will be very useful for you to be able to go back and look at those class recordings. Um, once again, and I wouldn't think of them as a perfect substitute for, for being in class, but those are something that once you sit down to work on those Excel assignments, I would like have Excel pulled up and have that class recording pulled up on YouTube because it's basically going to be a very similar thing, just a different data set. Right? Um, so that'll be kind of a good resource as we get to those Excel homeworks. I threw up some important dates here. Uh, some of these may, you know, everything in this class, if you look at the syllabus, which should be up on the files tab in Canvas, I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, has these dates in there as well. Everything is successfully uh, filled as a subject to change. So the way I view teaching any course, and I don't know, it's all a little bit of preferences. Um, you might like, I know some professors will give you like a weekly or class to class outline of exactly what you're going to cover. I just feel like putting things into a strict box like that. Why am I going to spend the whole class going over something if everybody's very easily, like getting it very quickly and easily? I'd much rather kind of transition and be able to talk about the next topic. Also, if I get closer to the exam date and I feel like we're not quite ready, maybe some things have happened, maybe there's been some inclement weather, we missed the class, I'm always going to be able to kind of push these, these dates up, you know, forward and back a little bit. Now, in terms of the exam dates, I'll never make them earlier. I would only ever kind of push them forward in time. Okay? Um, but I don't expect them to change. So these are kind of the tentative exam dates. They'll be in class. So we have two midterms and then the final. Um, these are some other important dates that we might want to be kind of aware of. The final exam I don't choose. Uh, and actually, to be completely honest, I have to check with someone. Uh, I think this will be our exam time slot. So I know that everybody, given all the uh, pandemic craziness of the last couple of years, may be aware of this. But if you went to like uh, Google Ball State final exam schedule, 
I don't choose these times. So the first link that was there, this is actually how you would figure out whatever class you have when the exam final exam time slot would be. So we're a three credit hour course at four on Monday and Wednesday, not Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There is no just Monday, Wednesday, three credit hour class at four. So I assume that none of you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class at four as well. Otherwise you couldn't be here and there at the same time. And so I'm assuming this would be our time slot. Um, but I wasn't hundred percent sure, uh, which is why I believe on the, on the slide, I kind of chose this open time slot. But as we get closer to that date, I'll just confirm, like I said, this is how every instructor is supposed to follow this, but our course is a little bit different. I'm not sure. Actually, I don't think we're technically supposed to be able to have this time slot. I don't know how we got it, but um, so that's kind of kind of where we're going with that. So I will update that as we get closer to it. But those two midterm dates, I would kind of expect, you know, not to be out of town or anything on those Wednesdays. Okay. All right. Let me go back here. So what do you care about, right? How are you going to get the grade that you want in this class? So 55% of the grades didn't come from the exams. And, you know, I know as a student, you always like to see this be as low as possible. Um, but we'll be doing some like exam review in class. I'll be putting up some practice exams as we get closer to those exam dates. Um, and I do something else that kind of makes it a little bit more in your favor. I forgot this isn't working, which is your lowest exam will only count for 10% uh, of the overall grade. Your second highest exam will be 20, and then your highest will be 25. So what this does, the fact that that worst exam only counts for 10%, it makes it so that if you've had a busy week, maybe you've had some personal things in your personal life, maybe you weren't feeling great that week and weren't able to study as much as you wanted, if you don't do well in one of these exams, it doesn't hurt you near as much as if I waited them all in right? So it's kind of allows your, your best exams to kind of influence your grade more. And if you happen to have not so good an exam, it doesn't like make it, uh, you know, you, it, it makes it so you can recover from it, right? Um, and obviously this means that along the way, kind of your grade will be changing a little bit more than if I could kind of treat them all equally, because I can't tell you what your best exam is when you've only taken one, right? So as you kind of take them, I'll just treat them as though they're your best and your second best. And then by the end of the semester, well, then we can kind of start to figure out exactly what they're ranking are. But towards the end of the semester, I'll talk a little more about this. I'll give you some kind of tools in Excel, which you should have a little bit more of an idea about how to navigate Excel by then, to kind of be able to make some future predictions about, but well, what if I did this well in the final, what would my grade be? And, and if I did this bad in the final, what would my grade be? And things like that. Is this clear what I'm kind of getting on here? Are you okay with this? Um, the next thing will be homework. So we're going to have two main types of homeworks, Excel projects and uh, this online homework platform from McGraw Hill, which is a uh, kind of reference you just call it Connect Homeworks. Okay? So they're both graded for whether or not you get things correct. So this is where kind of ability is going to play a role, but also effort, right? If you start these early, I am more than willing to help you with these. I am more than willing to answer questions. You started the day it's due, you know, you may not be have enough time to kind of email me, get good responses, go back and fix things. I think using my office hours, which I'll talk about in just a second, is a great thing for both of these types of homeworks. Um, I'll outline the Excel homeworks here a little bit more in just a second. But these Connect homeworks should be um, a little bit harder than probably what I would expect you to do on the exam because you'll have a lot more time. Uh, when I sign them, you'll never have less than like two weeks turnaround. So there'll be a pretty long period of time for which you can work on them. I would also suggest that as we work through material, kind of start to look at the next couple of questions on the connect assignment. So the first one is actually already up there on Canvas under the assignments tab. So we've got that first connect. After today, so you probably can't answer any questions on it, but after Wednesday and Friday's class, start to kind of look at the questions and you can start taking a few of them off at a time, right? So after Wednesday's class, maybe you can get through the first two questions or three questions. And then after Friday, the next two or three questions, right? And that way when it comes down to the due date, you don't have to work on all of them at one time and be answering questions about things we covered in class almost two weeks ago. Um, so you notice the due date is September 9th. That's quite a bit in the future, right? But if you kind of work along, you know, work at it along the way, it makes it a little bit less daunting. I also have what looks like an assignment up there. So it's chapter two, uh, tagging graphical methods. So 
I do see give uh, credit for these because I kind of have molded that or shifted things around. Um, these are really just study tools. So just like the pre-class videos, I really, I don't know, through the years I've recognized that being primed to talk about something really helps in understanding it, like as it's going into it completely cold and having no idea what I'm even talking about. So these are good. I always put them up prior to the when we talk about the topics. So I think this one I put, what, the 29th? Getting on, maybe going through this by the end of the week. It's going to be going over some of the things that we'll talk about Wednesday, but also on Friday, it's just up there and it's going to be available this week so that if you have some additional time, you can get on there. It'll give, you know, it's basically like uh, it'll read through some things, it'll ask you a couple questions, and, and they was, you know, basically familiarize you with some terminology. By no means will I expect you're going to be an expert at the topics after you go through one of these. But it at least just kind of sets you up for success once we start to talk about it in class. Right? So just additional resources. It's sure worth zero points. You don't have to do them. Uh, they're called smart book assignments, but like I guess I'm just using them for additional practice. So these connect assignments are the ones that are actually worth points, which you know kind of reflects here. You can see there's points here, there's no points. Yeah. So where are we at here? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. When I put learn smart. I don't that that was old. There we go. I'll fix that in the skeleton slides. So those aren't worth any points. They were just additional ones for practice. So the ones that are worth fifteen percent each are these connect assignments and these Excel assignments. We should have about uh six of each. Um, so six connect, six Excel assignments. As we get towards the end of the semester, I may decide to make it. Five Excel and seven connect just kind of depends on, on where we're at and, and how far we get into the, the last topic of linear regression. Um, but I would expect six of each, and then I'll drop the lowest of each type of homework. Right. So let's say you know you do the first five connect assignments. It's getting close to the end of the semester. You got a lot of research projects to do. That sixth one, if you did pretty well and didn't procrastinate on the first five, and you're happy with your grade. You don't do the sixth one and I drop the lowest, what happens? Well, the sixth one you would have gotten a zero. That has to be your lowest, it gets dropped, right? So this is where kind of front loading your effort in this course makes the end of the course a little bit easier, right? Um, also, same kind of idea with the exams. If you front load your effort in this course and you do well in the first two exams, that final doesn't influence your grade near as much. Final exam week, you have more than just this exam going on. Excuse me, makes life a little bit less stressful. Right, so front loading your effort in this course really, really helps. Also, first exam um, for sure, but the first two are probably easier than the final. Um, the earlier homeworks are probably easier than the later homeworks. And so kind of really making sure you stay on top of things early on in this course is really important for kind of setting yourself up for success. Okay. And then iClicker for online quizzes. So typically starting next Monday, um, I may use iClickers in class. So generally, this is how it would look, what it would look like. I might have four iClicker questions in a class. There's always going to be 10 points possible. For simply showing up and answering the questions, you'll get six out of the 10 base points. And then for each question you get correct, you get additional points. So if you get all four questions right, you get 10 out of 10 for the day. You get them all wrong, well, at least you still get six out of 10 for just showing up and answering. Right? So you could literally pay no attention to me at all just respond with whatever and you still get some points for showing up right this is supposed to be purely effort based now there's a little bit of that you have to get them correct but i'm generally pretty nice and we don't always have four iClear questions sometimes we might we might only have one well that means that just for showing up you get nine out of ten base points and then if you get the question correct you would get ten out of ten so generally if people show up to every class you should be getting you know about 90 percent if not higher of all of these points, right? And that's 15% of your overall grade. That can influence it quite a bit, even if you don't do, do as well on some of those, those uh, exams. Notice this category influences your grade more than your worst exam, right? So I've kind of built that in there to be a way that everything you do in life is a little philosophical, but everything's a combination of effort and ability, right? You have all the ability in the world, but if you don't put any effort in, you're not gonna get anywhere, right? And so this is a category where not really even ability, it's really just effort. Show up, answer the IQ questions, uh, and you'll be okay. It's also a way for me to create an incentive for you guys to show up to class. Once again, another thing I've realized in the last couple of years of the pandemic, uh, performance 
of those who regularly attend class and performance of those who don't, dramatically different, right? Um, like I said, I, I have ways of being able to track this because I can collect the data when I use things like class clickers and I can see the dramatic differences in the final final grade in the classes. Um, instead of eye clickers, some days I may choose to use online quizzes. So this is probably when I use those pre-class videos. I may, instead of using eye clicker questions, I may say, here's an online quiz on Canvas that goes along with this pre-class video and maybe has a couple questions um, related to that, right? Or sometimes along the way, I may actually just want some survey data from you guys. Um, that kind of helps me direct the course to be a little more interesting or to pertain to you a little bit more, um, but also give me some use, useful feedback so that I know what you guys are struggling with. So some of these online quizzes will be purely surveys. That means there's no wrong answers, right? So this is meant to be, if you just keep, you know, up to date with the course and you show up, these should be very easy points to get. And anytime I post an online quiz, I'll announce it in class, and I'll also post an announcement on campus, right? So you know that it's there, and it's not, you know, a surprise that you're watching, okay? And those online quizzes will always be worth, just like iClickers, 10 points, right? So every every day we have an iClicker, uh, we use iClickers, every day we have an online quiz, your total points for that will be 10 points. Right? So all treat equal. I think I forgot anything here. Oh, one thing. First of all, any questions before I keep going? No questions about excused absences. So the only way I excuse an absence, right, is if you have a university related event. So if you're on a sports team or any other, you know, kind of club or something, you guys have an event. I don't need documentation, but I'll excuse absence for that. Anything career related, right? That's the whole purpose you're here. So why am I going to penalize you if you've got an interview at the same time as class, right? So if you have any type of, or even a um, career fair or something, that you can give me some documentation that this is a kind of career building activity, I'd excuse the absence for that. Um, a prolonged sickness. If you've got to be out of class for, you know, more than two classes, so more than a week of classes, uh, I'll, can ex I'll excuse those, those absences as well. Now, if you get a cold or you wake up and you're not feeling too late, kind of flu one day, what I've done is I've built in there's three days right? That you can kind of essentially miss class because I'll drop your three lowest eye clicker scores, right? Like I said, most of your eye clicker scores are going to be eights, nines, or tens. And so really those are built, I built those in there to be zeros. If you have to miss class, I'll drop those three lowest, right? So what that means is probably should save this. The reason why I do this is because, you know, if you were sick, you know, anyone can go, get, they'll give you a sick Note from the health thing. I mean, you gotta just show up. They don't. They don't really care if you're like real, real sick. Or you know, if someone at if you if you know, I don't want to ask you for documentation. I mean, that's terrible, right? Like you're already in a terrible month because I don't want to have to do that. So there's three days. So if it's just going to be a minor thing where you miss one class, I don't have to kind of you know, deal with being, I guess, a little disrespectful in some situation, but also just question you on whether or not you're lying, right? Um, now, like I said, it's a prolonged sickness or something that's going to keep you out for, for over a week, you can kind of work with that and not excuse those absences. So, any questions? No. And if you ever have something you're not sure, right? this is kind of a career thing, or this, you know, feel free to email me. If you let me know ahead of time you're going to miss class, I'm pretty likely to excuse those absences just because you're coming to me ahead of time. I know it's not like, oh, I slept through class, which hopefully you're not sleeping through this class. Um, but right, it's it's just a way. Um, if you come to me after the fact, I'm gonna be a little bit less likely to probably be able to kind of work work with you on those absences. Okay. All right. So here's some like outline of how you get registered for those connect assignments, and also have access to those additional smart book study tools. And it's pretty self explanatory. Um, so the first homework, the first connect homework, as well as that um, additional chapter two smart book. If you just click on one of those on Canvas, it'll send you right to McGraw Hill, and it's just like signing up for Netflix or anything else, right? You register, you use your Ball State email address. Please use your Ball State email address, because if you don't, occasionally there's issues with it being able to sync up to Canvas, um, which isn't a big deal. I can do it manually. It just means, once again, kind of like a headache for me, and you don't get to see your grade as kind of uh, instantaneous. Okay. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. If you have any issues, once you click on one of those links, getting registered, please reach out, let me know. Of course, my uh, my 201 course, which some of you guys have, my 201 course, uh, the online 
online homework platform used there. Of course, uh, crashed today. So no, nobody can register. So, but I appreciate it because someone sent me an email and I got in touch with them. And they're like, oh yeah, sure enough, there's like an outage right now and we're having issues. So if you have any issues with this, let me know um, and we'll try to kind of get those ironed out. So the Excel assignments, I just want to spend a little more time talking about those. So this is a business statistics course. Um, I usually, you know, I will do a lot of business related examples, but I like to think of it more as like an applied statistics course because I'm not going to be doing such business specific examples. We'll do some things outside the realm of business, which some of it's just like human behavior, which really, I guess, isn't business, but at the same time, like in any business, you're cons you have consumers and customers, you're concerned with human behavior. So it really is in a way, a business related topic, but, um, one thing that we're going to be doing is, is trying to use Excel along with learning how to calculate all these statistics, right? So you're going to hate this. I'm telling you right now. So there will be at least five, maybe a six Excel assignment, like I said earlier. Um, let me see here. Let me just go here. I'll, I'll save the memes. But um, you're going to hate these assignments, which means do not be afraid to come in and ask me for help, right? Uh, I have office hours for a reason. I like to think, I don't know if I have a reputation for this, but I like to think I'm pretty available. Um, and if my office hours don't work, if you ever send me an email, we can almost always find a time to, to meet, as long as you don't email me like two hours before the homework is due or something like that. Um, but I know that these are really important. So I always tell a couple um, stories, which is that I'm on the economic advisory board here, which means that we have to like pass along. We're working out there for the often kind of provide internship opportunities for the econ majors. Um, and every single one of them, I've been to a couple events that they've had with students, and they say, you know, if they're going through a resume and they see, even if you're not like wildly proficient, but you have the ability to discuss or say that you've used Excel to do certain things or any other statistical program. So some of you, depending on your major, you might do something like R or SAS or uh, SPSS. But I'm just going to teach you the most basic, which is Excel, and which is probably used uh, just about everywhere, right? And I, uh, these past alum have all said, if I see anything, even if it's just Excel, but they've used it to work with data, they pull that resume out and that goes in the pile we want to interview, right? And so it sets you kind of above everybody else having or being able to be more proficient in Excel. I've also had other students reach out. A lot of these companies now, part of their interview process, even for internships, is they'll give you like a mini Excel project that they say they want you to work on and then send to them, right? So I know that these companies are using this. I know that it's going to be an advantage to you guys to know how to, to work with Excel. So I'd really be doing you the service if I don't teach you how to do it. Um, but it's not easy, right? Because you're now trying to learn stats. And I'm assuming you know nothing about Excel, right? So those connect homeworks, one thing I didn't mention is there's a little check my answer tool, um, you know, which... If I give you a multiple choice question, you can check your answer and you just go, A, is that right? No. Is B, is that right? No. And just guess everything, right? And I have somewhat of been, or some, somewhat been told that that's basically what the ISIM course does, um, that you can kind of get through that and have almost no knowledge about Excel. So I start out assuming you know nothing about Excel. I start out you've never even opened the program, right? So don't be worried if you've never used it or you don't feel like you're, you're very good at it. I'm starting out like you've never opened it, right? So I'll kind of walk us through very, very slowly at first about what everything in Excel means, um, and I won't take like anything for granted, right? And if you ever have questions I'm working through Excel examples, always stop me. I don't know if you can kind of already tell, but especially once I get excited about something, I can kind of get going. So if you ever need me to stop, I'm going too quick, raise your hand, ask a question, even if it's just, what did you say, right? So I can kind of kind of reset. Um, yes, yeah, so these are really important. Um, I'll always work through something in class that looks very, very similar to your Excel assignments. And maybe it's not all in one day, right? Maybe it's like three classes. We work through three different examples and then all of them are kind of combined or at least different parts of that Excel assignment. But anything in one of those Excel homeworks will always be something we did almost identical. We all had examples almost identical in class, which is we're having these recordings will be helpful, um, but also showing up and paying attention, right? So I usually try to also announce when we're going to be doing some Excel work in the thought next class, because I think it's really helpful. I can see a few of you have computers. Um, it's helpful to work along with me. So I'll always put those files that I'll be working through up on Canvas. So you can kind of work along with me in class. 
And that way you can also like ask questions and see what's tripping me up in Excel because it's got like syntax stuff, right? So, you know, cause of death, Microsoft Excel, but then also that feeling when you get the Excel function right on the first try, we start using some of these Excel functions. It's like you forget a comma and the whole thing goes crazy, gives an error message. You know, it's, it's, and you can spend an hour and you just can't see it. You, you look at it for too long and you don't realize, oh, I just forgot an apostrophe or something stupid, right? So if it's ever taken you way too long and you're like convinced that, well, I, I've got how we did it in class. I think that I got entered in the right way. What am I not seeing? Never hesitate to just send me a quick email with your file because often it'll be like something I can see right away and just send you a quick email back. Get rid of that comma, right? Or you forgot a greater than sign, right? Just something simple that you might just be overlooking. So I want you to take a stab at it first, but if you're just beating your head against the wall because something's not working, you know, please, please reach out. Because my goal, one of my big goals of these Excel assignments, and one thing that I hope you take leaving this course is some ability to work in Excel, right? And like I said, I know it's going to be kind of a pain at first kind of getting into it, but it really is a pretty powerful thing. So that's my spiel on Excel. So, all right. So how do you pass this class? Come to class, pay attention, right? So there's two components to that. Come to class, get the easy eye clicker quest or easy eye clicker points, but also paying attention. So you can have a computer. Like I said, when we do Excel stuff, it's probably a good idea to work along with me. But if you know it's a distraction, you know you're going to be on, I don't know, ESPN or shopping on, I don't know, what's my life? I want to shop on machine like all the time now. So, you know, if you're going to be doing something else, don't bring your laptop or at least don't have it pulled open in front of you, right? And have to self-govern yourself a little bit there. Uh, do those, or kind of go through some of those smart book practice assignments. Make sure you're watching these pre-class videos. These are both really tools to just kind of pr prime your brain for what we're going to talk about. Do the homework, right? Like, just do it. I mean, even if you know you've got an hour left, you've got every single one of the connect questions to go through, and you know you won't get it done, start working through and doing the easy ones, the ones that you know how to do. A zero is a hell of a lot better than a 50. A zero can tank your grade. 50 is not good, but it's not going to, like, derail you, right? So you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I use this in every course that I do, so your you repeaters you've seen this before right um not repeaters of this course but i mean i've had you <laughs> um my office hours i mentioned earlier but monday wednesday and thursday two to four right so the two hours prior to this course i'll be around my office right um if those don't if that doesn't work for you thursday i'll be here from two to four as well if that doesn't work for you you've got a full schedule of classes just in those time slots um send me an email we can find a time i'm here every single day with the exception of Fridays, I probably won't be here uh, as late in the afternoons, um, but especially since our class goes to 5.15, I'll probably end up being around the building from about, I don't know, 8 or 9 to 6, Monday through Thursday. Okay. I also have a GA. Um, well, I actually haven't really gotten to talk to you yet this week because we just got the assignments uh, on Sunday. Um, but if for that reason, you don't like me or I scare you or something, um, they're also kind of available to help you. Um, so help me help you. Does anybody know who this is from? It looks familiar. I can't. I can't tell who's the actor. Tom Cruise. You guys have watched it. I'll use memes. I'll also give you some. Is Mission memes. Impossible? No. Give you some. Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Right. So I had a section earlier today. Nobody knew it. If you haven't seen Jerry Maguire, great old movie. Go out and watch it. I'll give you some of these little kind of gem movies along the way. So that's kind of the syllabus. Right, that is um, a little bit of an overview of kind of what I expect out of you guys in this course. Um, unless there's any other questions, we'll kind of dive into just talking about statistics a little bit, um, talking about what data is and, and kind of what we're going to be looking at throughout this semester. Want to do with all that? Okay. Oh, we're really looking at the time. So, I put a few data sources up here. Anytime I show you data, I always try to tell you where I got it from. Um, and I don't explicitly say it. We'll be looking at things like uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, this is like unemployment data, um, maybe some like county level um, income or demographics. Um, we've got some other economic data like GDP. I think we'll look at unemployment rates, maybe not today, but definitely on Wednesday. I've got this huge kind of survey data that I'll pull stuff from. But, I'll try to look at a little bit of everything, right? Because I know that you've all got different majors. 
Uh, you all probably have different interests, right? So I'll try to grab a lot of different types of data. Uh, I said one of the goals that I want in this class is that you have a pretty good understanding of Excel and uh, The other main thing that I want you to be able to do is know when people are BSing, right? So uh, I get on like any major media publication, and I'm always frustrated by every single title I see because uh, a lot of times they lie about with statistics, right? It's very easy if someone doesn't understand statistics to be able to lie with them just by throwing different numbers at them. So just a couple examples, right? California has more teachers in Arizona. So the you know, article or whoever concludes that California cares way more about their children's education. So why doesn't this make any sense? Here I got you. I got 20 of shit. Oh, stop checking. <laughs> Hold up. You guys don't need about it. All right, yeah. So it doesn't really work me to sharpen. I don't have a sharpie. Sorry. All right. So what's wrong with kind of this conclusion, right? So California has more teachers than Arizona, but California cares more about the children's education. Well, I'm sure California gets more schools. I pray to God they have more teachers, right? They got way more students. So this statistic, just a simple count of teachers, doesn't really help us. So what kind of statistic might we want here? Not the number of teachers, but maybe either, either, yeah. Number student. yeah, teachers per student ratio. Uh, student per teacher ratio, teacher per student, however you want to measure that. Right, but we don't have the correct statistic here or data. So, another one. Small market teams have won six of the last 10 World Series, so the person includes when he does my championships. Okay. Well, to give a little context, so small market just means that the team's in a smaller city, generates less revenue, doesn't have as much money to afford as with high quality players. And so we would expect that larger markets that have larger revenue streams are able to buy higher quality talent and more likely to win. Right? So this kind of goes against that conventional wisdom. But why do you think they only look at the last 10? If I went back to the 11th year and a small market team had won it, well, now it says 6 out of 10. I've got 7 out of 11, which is actually a little bit better. So probably in that 11th year, it was probably a large market team because 6 out of 11 isn't as good as 6 out of 10. And maybe if I go back 20 years, maybe it's only six out of 20, right? Maybe it's just kind of something weird that's happened this decade, right? And so anytime you see data that's like censored, like they stopped at 1980, or they only looked at the last 14 years, think about why were they only collecting data over that time period, right? Um, so it's another kind of example we can see. Uh, this is another example I always like, uh, and Bernie's day one. But a study found 90% of bar fight deaths were the individual who started the fight. So karma is a fill in the blank. So we think about this. Anytime there's a bar fight between two individuals and someone dies, there's only one person left to ask who started the fight, unless we've got some bystanders who saw it all coming up. So if that person who's remaining says that they started the fight, they're basically admitting they started the fight that led to someone dying. I don't know how this is 100%, right? Why in the world is anybody admitting they started the fight when it results in someone dying? Right? So we got to think about where the data is coming from. Right, it might be bias. We'll talk more about what bias means when we get later on in the semester. All right, but this is another thing we can kind of think about. You know, where's that data coming from? The kind of last age-old example I'll give you, um, and we really won't go over this until really the probably last couple of weeks of the semester. But it's what I find the most interesting is being able to dis disentangle correlation from causation. Right? So higher ice cream sales are highly correlated with higher drowning deaths. Those two move, things move in almost in sync, right? So ice cream sales are causing people to die. Doesn't make any sense. We know this, right? So they're definitely highly correlated though. So what's something that might cause both of these things to be high? Uh, better weather. Yeah, hot weather, right? Anytime it's hotter, ice cream sales go up, but also drowning deaths go up, right? So we have this kind of third factor that we weren't entering into the equation, and we're not actually looking at a causal effect, but it was just they're correlated because they're also both correlated with this outside factor, warm weather, which is actually causing both of them to go up. So we'll get, like I said, we'll tackle that more towards the end of the semester. But these are all just kind of like fun. No, no, no. Maybe they're not fun. But the examples to think about, like, you see something and, like, it's not what the, the conclusion they're making is not accurate given what the statistics tell us. Right? And we'll be able to come up with more complicated ones as we as we go through more statistics. All right.
So I've got like a really simple data set here. Um, I forget what year this is now. I think this might have been the year after the World Series or maybe it was the year of, I don't remember now. Um, but I grabbed some old Cubs roster data just to kind of use as an example. I will try to refrain from using too many sports examples. Sports data is very easy to get, uh, which is which is why uh, one of the reasons why we use it. Um, but um, I really will try to give you a lot of other examples other than that. So here we've basically got I think it's what, 10, 11 different players. You've got their position on the team and what their salary is. Right? So it doesn't really matter if this is sports data. We can think of this could be any company, right? I've got 10 employees. I've got their position at the firm, and I get how much I'm paying them, right? Just because it's a, a sports roster, it could very easily be any other company's um, kind of work, uh, you know, employees and et cetera. So if I look at a data set like this, anytime I'm looking at a row, I want to think about this as an observation. Or if you do actually buy a version and crack open the book, it might call them elements. If you go over to the stats department, they call them elements. Anybody in this building, any professor you talk to, you will think about these as observations, right? So those are two, you know, those two terms are synonymous. I will never probably use element for the rest of the semester. I just introduce it to letting you know that you might see that used out somewhere else. So every row is an observation. And it's basically we're collecting data on each one of these, in this case, individuals, right? I'm using individual's name, position, salary. So name, position, salary, those things I'm collecting for each observation, those columns will be my variables, right? So every column is gonna be a different variable and every row is a different observation. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be people. I could be collecting data on countries. There, every row, every country is my observation and I might collect you know, the country's name, the country's GDP, the country's, I don't know, average income, wh whatever I'm looking for, right? So columns are variables, or observations are rows. And generally that first row is just like the name of each variable. It's not like a, a separate observation. This is more of just like titles of what we're gonna call the variables, okay? So different types of data we're gonna look at. The first is gonna be qualitative, right? So I'll try to break this down uh, here in a second, kind of draw a little tree up here on the board. We're going to be looking at two different types, qualitative and quantitative data. Right? So qualitative data is probably not what we generally think of as data. Data, generally, if you say that word, someone's thinking numbers, right? Qualitative data is some type of a label, a word that's describing a characteristic about, excuse me, about the observation. So maybe if I was to like create a data set for you guys and I start collecting everybody's eye color, Eye color is going to be blue, brown, whatever. It's a characteristic, it's a label, it's not a number. It would be qualitative data, okay? Excuse me. I guess here's the other one. You know, maybe I have a used car data set. And so every single car is gonna have a different color, blue, green, silver. It's not a number. I can't rank the observations based off of the color. I mean, I guess I personally could if I have a preference, but right, in terms of, the color of that car doesn't really tell me anything else about that car. I can't rank them based off that color. So that's a qualitative variable. The second one we have is quantitative, right? So these are numbers, these are numerical variables, right? So maybe if I think about I'm collecting data on you guys, instead of eye color, maybe I look at height. Well, height, I could you know, measure in inches or centimeters, whatever. I actually have a numerical value recorded for each one of you or for every single observation right? that's a number that's a quantitative variable you use car data set maybe i record the mileage of every single car that's a numerical value that's a quantitative variable so those are kind of like i want to think about it and i'm just going to abbreviate here you can write out the entire word if you want we've got qualitative and quantitative variables okay? underneath each one of those categories i've got two different types right so under my qualitative variables, the first one I have is nominal, right? And I've already given you two examples of that, car color or eye color for individuals, right? It's a non-numerical, you know, label that records some characteristic about the individual or the car, right? But I can't rank them. It doesn't really give me any intrinsic value about those observations, right? It tells me nothing about their intrinsic value. So I think I've already got my examples here. I've already mentioned uh, hair color. Uh, another thing that we'll often use this semester, I'll just start off right away. 
I'm not saying I'm not, it's not my specialty. I'm not even diving into the realm of whether gender is binary, but almost every data set we look at, if we have a gender or a male variable or a female variable, it will be recorded as a one zero, right? That's just, that's just how it generally is. That's just how we're going to deal with it throughout the rest of it. I'm not saying anything about that. It's not my expertise. That's just how the data generally comes in. Okay. So that's, and that's something, right? We can't rank the observations based off of gender. And that's a good example of a nominal, which nominal variables are all qualitative variables. Okay. Baseball positions, right? I had that Cubs roster data. We had that position, or we could think about the position at a firm. It's a word, starting pitcher. First baseman, uh, assistant to the regional manager, right? Um, these are just words that describe the position. We can't necessarily rank them based off of that. It tells us nothing of an intrinsic value of those players or of those individuals at the company. And so positions or baseball positions here would be another great example of a nominal variable. Yeah? Any questions on, on that before we get going? Not too bad. Pretty, pretty easy here. So I had that starting position. I already kind of mentioned that. We go back to that, that roster data. So the second type of qualitative variable that we have is ordinal, right? So I just write this out because it's kind of a nice visual that we've got qualitative, quantitative variables. Under the qualitative umbrella, we have nominal and ordinal variables. So one kind of other word that we might think that goes really well with ordinal variables is being able to rank the data, right? So remember, ordinal variables are still qualitative here, right? So we've still got a qualitative variable, but now we can rank the data based off of this kind of non-numerical value. So how can we do that? So I'll give you a couple examples. So let's think about the first one. At the end of the semester, you will be asked a question, hopefully all of you fill out the survey, about whether or not I'm in an overly effective teacher, effective instructor. You can respond with strongly disagree up to strongly agree. These are not numbers. Right? These are non-numerical responses, so they are qualitative variable. This would be a qualitative variable. But if somebody strongly agrees with this statement, I know that they think I'm a better teacher than someone who strongly disagrees. Right? I can rank the observations based off of this qualitative variable. That makes it ordinal. Right? Also, you know, ordinal is like uh, east, west, south, north. So that's kind of the idea is you can rank them based off of it. Okay? Um, now. One thing I'll point out is within each one of these categories, right? If I saw two observations where both people strongly agreed, I can't rank the data, you know, I can't rank those two observations, right? They both strongly agree. I don't know who strongly agrees more than the other person, right? But I know anyone who said strongly agrees would rank me higher than someone who just agreed. Okay? And so kind of ordinal variables are a little bit more useful, but we can't completely rank the data based off of them. Within each one of these responses, I, I don't know who strongly agrees more than the other. Right? Um, another good one is kind of education level. So a lot of data sets we'll look at, or if you've ever filled out surveys or, or anything, a lot of times they'll ask you what your education level is. They don't ask, ask you exactly how many credit hours you took in college or what. They say you have less than a high school degree, you have a high school degree only, you have some college, but not a college degree, you have a college degree, and then you have a kind of a graduate degree, right? Um, you know, maybe I took a few graduate courses and never graduated, so I only have a college degree. Uh, there, there's no category for that, right? So once again, I can rank the data based off this response, but anybody that responded with some college, I don't know who took more credit hours than, than the other, right? Unless I ask a follow-up question, right? So another good example of it's not a number, right? Non-numerical, so it's qualitative, but I can rank the data based off the response so I know it's an ordinal variable, okay? Anybody think of any other ordinal variables? Let me think of one that might pertain to this class. Okay. So if I can see what your percentage grade was, that's a different story, right? But all I see is your letter grade in the class. That's a ordinal qualitative variable, right? If I'm looking at two people that have a, a B plus, I don't know who had a better B plus than the other person, right? But I know the person with a B plus did better than the person that has a D. So letter grades are another really good example of an ordinal variable. I can rank the, the database off of it, but I, I can't, you know, within each specific type of response there, I can't rank the, you know, who had the higher B, right? 
unless I ask once again a follow-up question and get a numerical value there. So you can kind of already see qualitative variables not quite as useful in most situations uh, as quantitative. So the majority of this course, we will focus on quantitative variables. Okay. Excuse me. Where are we at? All right. I am going to let you guys a little bit early, but but not quite yet. So I, I got to make sure we, we get through a decent amount of material this first week. So we'll do the other two types of quantitative variables, and then we'll probably call. So the very first one here under quantitative would be discrete variables. Right? So discrete variables are quantitative. They're going to be a numerical response. Right? But we can't see just any response for these. So typically, the best way to think about discrete variables and the types of variables that I will use in this class that are discrete will only be integers, right? So if I'm thinking about kind of a number line, I'll come back to the examples in a second. I could see one as the response. I could see five, but I can't see 7.39. So what would maybe a variable that I'm recording look like? Well, maybe the number of siblings that you have, right? You either have zero siblings, one, two, three, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, they are your sibling, we're not going to count a half sibling as one half, right? They're still a sibling. You know, hopefully you don't have like half a sibling, right? That would be a bad thing. Um, but all we can see there are kind of these integer responses, right? Same kind of thing, the number of days you do something a week. So here I said the number of days you consume alcohol each week. I left off zero. I guess I should have put that on there. I wasn't thinking about that. Um, but, right, zero. But as soon as you take a drink, like, let's say I took a drink on month, you know, today. Well, I've had a drink one of the seven days, right? There's no in-between. Once I have a drink, that counts as I had a drink on one day. And if I drink tomorrow, I had a drink on two days, and so on and so forth, right? But I can only do integer jumps. I can't have anything in between, okay? And you'll see a lot of this in survey data. The alcohol one's kind of goofy, but like, if you ask somebody how many, you know, how many days a week um, do you, I don't know, exercise or something like that. You're only gonna be able to see integer responses. That's what we should be thinking about as discrete variables for this class. Now, if you want to get really, really theoretical here and you want to be real precise, I sometimes will have people say, well, you know, maybe I have a discrete example be something like, um, oh, I, I, could, I could have a response where for whatever reason, the quantities produced are only produced in hundreds. Like, you know, every batch of the product that's produced will be a batch of 100, right? So I may see something where I can only see 0, 100, 200, 300. That's still a discrete variable, right? Because there's gaps in between the responses. I won't use anything like that in this class to try to trip you up. We'll only be looking at integers when we talk about discrete variables, okay? And I'll throw in another wrinkle here in just a second after we talk about the next type. Do you have a question? Any questions on, on this? So the last one, I got a slide for it. I'm just going to write it here since I'm next to the board, is continuous, right? So continuous variables are quantitative, but unlike the discrete variables, they can take on the value of 2, 5, but also 6.3591742, right? A truly continuous variable, I can see any response, and that includes going out as many decimals as I want, right? So a truly continuous variable, I can see any response on this number line. Okay. And sometimes I'm a little bit tripped up by this, um, because like, let's say I looked at something like height or weight. Height's maybe an easier one. We know that the tallest person is definitely going to be shorter than 10 feet tall. And at the very least, no one in recorded human history has been taller than that that we have ever. So the shortest person is, I don't know, whatever the shortest recorded person is, definitely taller than zero inches, right? So we know there's a range. So you might think, well, that can't be continuous, right? Because it can't take on any value. But if I'm measuring height, as long as I had a precise enough tool, I can measure it out to whatever decimal I want. So even if it was in between zero and one, if I could see any decimal, how many possible values are there in between zero and one? Infinite number of actual, you know, I can go out to whatever decimal, it never stops, right? So even if there's a limited range, as long as I can see any decimal responses, we're going to think of that as a continuous variable, right? So for this class, like I said, you get real theoretical there, um, but the easiest way to think about it is discrete integers, right? You've got gaps. You can only see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
Continuous <laughs> is anytime we have a decimal associated with a variable, we can think of that as a continuous variable. Okay. So height, weight, salary, right? We can kind of think about that as being a continuous variable as well. So here's where uh, I sometimes have like a smart ass in class tell me that salary is actually discrete. So why could salary be thought of as discrete? So the true definition of discrete is that there's gaps in between the responses you could see. Because you can't go after the hundreds place. Yeah, the lowest denomination we have is a penny, right? So technically, there are gaps, right? If I want a guy, what's the first amount I can pay someone? Zero cents, then one cent, two cent. I can't get one and a half, right? So technically, you know, you could think of, you know, if you go over to the stats department, they might tell you it's theoretically, technically, it's discrete. But for this class, anytime I give you a variable that's recorded out to any decimal, we'll be treating that and thinking about that as continuous. And there's actually some mathematical proofs that you actually can treat it as continuous, and that's how we should be doing it anyways. But that's a little bit outside the scope of the class. So anytime it's decimal, think about continuous variables. Okay. Uh, another good time for me to drop a great movie you guys should see. Has, has uh, anybody seen Office Space in here? Yeah, you should all go out and watch Office Space. But the premise of the movie there is like uh, banks, like actually like salaries and things like that, actually sometimes do have like 0.33 repeated. And they were looking at all these like transactions made with uh, buying and selling stocks. And they were just like cutting it off at a penny and then storing those in a bank account. So like thousands of a penny. But if you do that for every single trade that happens on the stock market every day, that adds up really, really, really quickly. Sounds like a really nerdy premise for a movie. Well, the movie's hilarious. I, I, I swear to you, that one definitely holds up. So if we look at continuous variables, we can kind of think about salary here. I think I cut off the decimals just to make the, the data set look a little bit prettier earlier, uh, but we can think about that salary being a continuous variable. Okay. So what we're going to do on Wednesday, go over some different types of data sets that we'll look at. So now that we know what variables are, now that we've been able to come up with our observations, the different types of variables that we might collect information on, we'll have a couple different data set structures, and then we'll actually start going into how do we take data, how do we take these variables, and create graphs and tables with them. So on Canvas, under the Files tab, I might create a new folder that says uh, in-class data, and I'll put up an Excel file that we're going to use next class. Okay, we won't be doing a ton of work in Excel, but I'll be showing you a little bit how you take an existing data set and create a table or a graph from it. Okay. So the other things that I want to mention before you leave, what should you be doing by the end of the week? So one, get either the physical version or the app, which is iClicker Student, right? Get that registered on Canvas. <laughs> Register for that online homework platform. You probably can't answer any of the questions yet, but after Wednesday's class, you definitely get to start working on that first connect assignment. Um, and then the third thing um, would be, I think I'm actually here if I kind of wrap the first two of these. So you've got the iClicker registration, you've got the connect registration. Um, try to get those done by the end of the week. Um, other than that, let's look at any questions for me. You good? Yeah. Are you still need the iClicker on Wednesday? No, so I won't start using those for points till Monday. I might have some slides that I like kind of show you what it would look like. And so we can get like a practice run just so you can kind of see how I would ask you an item question, but I won't be using them for points until next Monday. So you got it really got a week to get it done. I'm saying the end of the week, but I just think of that it's easier because I don't want to do anything on the weekend. All right, so just get it done by the end of the week and enjoy your first weekend. Uh, back. Okay. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.